Welcome to Real Estate Accredited, where we go over the nuts and bolts of real estate investing. I'm your host, Jeff Rodriguez, with my co-host, Philip Shilligan. We are co-founders of Boost Capital Group, a real estate investment firm that works with uh, busy professionals to diversify the portfolios into real estate assets. Today, we're going to go over some real estate topics. And Philip, what are we going over today? So today we're going to talk about unlocking your wealth in 2024. Is investing in multifamily real estate the right place to be? You want to do the disclaimer? Oh yeah, please review the disclaimer. But just so if uh, someone has their camera, they're, they're not reading right now, they're, they're driving, Boost Capital Group, we do not provide tax or legal advice. This, in, this is for informational purposes only and should not be construed as investment advice or an offer or solicitation to buy and sell securities. Now that we've got that important tidbit out of the way, let's proceed. All right. So topic of the day, unlock your wealth in 2024 is investing in multifamily real estate relevant. So just to start the, this presentation with kind of a general, I'm sure everybody is aware of the multiple benefits, I just listed a few here pertaining to multifamily real estate, but we can start with the stability of multifamily investments compared to other real estate sectors and particularly in, during economic downturns. And we'll discuss that a little more in the coming slides. I think a good example of a real estate sector that is in difficulty right now is the office space. Since COVID and, and people started to work more and more remotely, a lot of buildings that are empty, as an example. So next we have the cash flow. And also we'll talk a little bit more about that in the coming slides, but we do particularly a focus on cash flowing assets and <clears throat> for acquisitions and in a nutshell the cash flow is going obviously to be coming from I'm covering you. the income You're that we collect to thanks to rents you. and other okay. okay yes okay just muted put out there rents and other income and after expenses, that's the cash flow and paying also the any debt on the particular asset. Another benefit of multifamily is going to be the scale because you're going to acquire a number of units at once. So just from that standpoint, in one transaction compared to single family, for instance, you're going to be able to acquire many more units and to have more units under management is going to simplify actually the management of it to, and also allow for economy of scale. And finally, again, from a general standpoint, the tax benefit is linked to real estate is going to be the depreciation. That's something we've mentioned and discussed several times before. So next, we, we want to start since... We're looking more particularly at the, the current market conditions, what's going on in the market, in, in the economy right now. So current state of the economy and the outlook for the rest of the year. And by the way, I used particularly JP Morgan Wealth Management and Moody's as for inputs on those things. And every everybody, every every other groups that have looked at, every, they're, they're all saying more or less the same thing. But so in, in terms of current state and outlook, we're looking at the job growth that is still positive, but slowing down compared to the past years. The employment is expected to remain low. Inflation is expected to be at 2% by the end of the year, which is the target for the Federal Reserve. And as a result of that, because that's their benchmark, the uh, effective federal funds rate is expected to be cut several times this year, which is actually pretty good for the real estate market. And that's also something we'll discuss in, in the upcoming slides. What are the headwinds? So the first one, and as a general kind of a blanket statement, the growth is expected to slow down. 
It was quite strong, interestingly enough, in 2023 at 2.8%, increase of the GDP. And right now, depending on what you read, it, it ranges from 1% to 2% for 2024, which is still, is still decent. And a 1% to 2% GDP growth would also explain how we can hit the uh, 2% inflation rate for the year. So that's not, it's not terrible. It's, uh, it's really linked. One, one is linked to the other. But I should have said, yeah, and I put N here. I found this interesting chart during a Marcus and Millichap webinar. And it was an analyst from Moody's who put it up. And the goal here is not to necessarily go over all the, these different events, but just to give a perspective. And so you have a number of risks that have been identified and they are uh, placed on this chart. So horizontally, it's going to be how severe the impact of that particular risk would be on the economy. And in the vertical axis is the uh, likelihood of the risk. And you can see that there must be 15 or 20 different risks identified here with different impacts. But I think the most too critical are the ones in red, particularly right now, the Middle East, different wars and other, whatever you want to call that, so uh, that may have international repercussion and obviously repercussion in the, on the uh, U.S. economy. Particularly, if you look at oil prices, which is just above it, oil prices are going to be directly affected by anything going on in the Middle East. The other thing that we know is coming is the it's labeled here at global elections, which there are many a, a number of elections like throughout the world, but more particularly in the U.S. presidential elections coming up, and that also may, may have and usually has an impact on the economy in, in in America, and especially I think there's a, some expectation that potentially this upcoming election could be pretty close. And if it's pretty close, then it's going to be contested and et cetera, et cetera. So there's a little bit of a, there's a certain risk around that as well. I'll pass on the other ones, unless someone has a question, otherwise I'll, I'll move forward. So shifting gear here. So wh why investing in housing in general? And one, I would say the, the housing is a primary need. For people, so it is going to be very resilient during downturns, right? You may decide not to go on vacation if there's a downturn, but you still need housing, right? So hotels are going to be hit, but not how housing in general is not going to be hit, for instance. Next, there has been a chronic, you can see since 2012, housing underproduction. And you can see that it became worse. So as of 2021, it was estimated that there's a lack of almost 4 million uh, houses and apartments. And here I want particularly to mention this report is very interesting. If you're interested, you can go at upforgrowth.org, but particularly the National Multifamily Housing Council and the National Association of Realtors have sponsored this report and they're sponsoring this website, this research, and it's very detailed. It explains pretty well what are the underlying uh, reasons why there is housing underproduction. It's just uh, what's interesting, like the conclusion is the what we're looking at here. You have millions of housing units that are lacking in America, and you can see that as of 2021, almost 200 metropolitan areas are affected by that. So that has an effect on supply and demand. And I think what's visible from that standpoint is so you have a strong demand of on housing in general, and particularly that generates a gap between the affordability of 
how much it costs to rent an apartment, which is in orange here on this chart, compared to owning a house. And that's going to be average numbers in the US. Currently, renting an apartment, the average it is $1,800 and owning a home with a home payment is $3,000. At the same time, and I guess it's a little bit, there's a link between the home payment level at $3,000 and how many houses are, are being sold is because of the high interest rates. So it's people who are owning houses and we have very low interest rates in place. They don't want to sell. Now there's less available housing units to be purchased and it's a, a, a vicious circle right now. And that explains also the gap here between the affordability gap. So that puts, obviously, owning multifamily apartments in a good position um, for an investor to consider. Next, the other side of supply and demand is there are a number of markets. And here you can see some, it's a census chart dating from 2023. Anything in a, a darker green, it was a change in, of population year over year. That is of 3% or more. And you can see, interestingly enough, it's not Atlanta proper in Georgia. It's going to be the surrounding areas. I do recognize the shape of Gwinnett County where I live. And I think, Laura, you said maybe you are also on, on I don't know if you're on the Gwinnett side or the cab side, but to dark green. Yeah, just there. Go ahead. I'm just south of Gwinnett. I'm okay. literally on the line. So the okay. cap that line. Okay, so it will be also a higher growth area in any case. But yeah. so you have the whole Florida, most of Florida is in that pretty strong growth as, as well. Texas and I assume those are the counties around Dallas Fort Worth. Dallas. You have also yeah. North Carolina, South Carolina, Tennessee, interestingly enough, and some other States yeah. to, to the West, but it's more, there are some spots here and there, but consistently you can see Southeast of the US and Texas, it is where there's a strong population growth. So those are definitely the markets you want to focus on. And that's what we do ourselves. All right. We can, we can cover why the economy, why consider real estate in general, why more specifically multifamily but now we're looking uh, at why investing in multifamily now. And so here I'm showing two, two charts. One, one is from CBRE, which is a, a lender on the bottom left. On the top, it's a chart from CoStar. And both of these charts are, are showing the, the cap rates or capitalization rates and cap rates being an indicator of where prices are in general. And I put the formula on the uh, bottom right there. And not going too deep on that topic, the lower the cap rate, the higher the prices. So you can see that historically, if we look at the CoStar chart and the US line that is in orange, since 2010, Cap rates have gone down, meaning that prices went up. And as soon as the interest rates turned, cap rates went up, meaning that the prices went down. It was like, if debt is expensive, it's going to be much more, put much more burden on your cash flow, basically on your net operating income. And then you will not be able to afford paying as much for properties. And so you can see the, the both chart also the, the CBRE is showing multiple asset classes. The uh, multifamily is the darker gray. So more or less, we are looking at very similar shapes turning around 2008, 2009. There's a peak in cap rates around the end of tw uh, 2009. So here it's showing more maybe in 2010. So you can see like the two sources are a little bit maybe uh, a few months off. And what's interesting is that in the forecast, 
<clears throat> so CBRE is planning for the peak of the market to come in 2024. Right now, Costar, it's more in 2025, actually, but we're certainly very close at a low point in the market and prices. In other words, if you're paying less right now to buy real estate, it's a very good time to enter the market because we are at a low point in the market. I hope that makes sense. So everybody has been very quiet, no questions. So we'll just move on. They're taking a lot of notes. It's a lot of note taking. Good. good. And that, that's really my last slide here for talking about why, why is it a good time in 2024 to, to invest. And those are more, I would say, general remarks, maybe not necessarily specific, specific to to this current time, but specific to what we're doing at Boost Capital Group. We are doing in-place, multifamily value-add. And I just wanted to touch on the in-place and the value-add side. So in-place, why it's, is it interesting to go with in-place assets, meaning that they're already built? is because they are cash flowing assets, right? To compare an in-place asset, an existing asset to a ground up construction, you don't have a gap in cash flow, right? Because when you do ground up construction, you have to develop the land and do the horizontal, build the foundations and whatnot, bring the, the utilities, etc., or build the roads in some cases, and then do the construction and then do the lease up. And until you start leasing, there will be the gap in cash flow. There's no cash flow that can be generated at, at that stage. The next remark there is to say that there is no risk to all of these activities that I just mentioned, all the development activities and the, the risks tied to these activities, they range from permit delays, to labor shortage. Obviously, there's a ton of labor to be performed when you do ground up. And we have experienced in the past years labor shortage, especially with a market where the, the unemployment is so low. I think people in general, they can pick and choose where, where they work. And there's been a, a number of, of industries impacted by that. Next, I wanted to mention also the supply chain disruption. Obviously, it was very prevalent during COVID, but just recently there was an incident at the Baltimore port that will probably result in some sort of supply chain disruption. Finally, also I wanted to mention the cost of debt. And you have to realize that when you do ground up development at every stage, you may use a particular type of debt. And when you go from one stage to the next, it's going to be a new loan. And when it's time between when you start land development and you're ready to do the construction, there could be a different time frame and it could be a different interest rates. That's why when interest rates went up, there's a number of new developments that just stopped they didn't proceed because their business plan didn't make any sense anymore. So that's the type of risk that you have with ground up construction. Finally, I also wanted to mention what we do, which is the value add. And this is how we are able to really generate typically the bulk of the returns for investors. At 50%, if not more, of, of all the returns, they're going to come from the, the value-add component of it. And the value-add, doing value-add on a deal means incre increasing the net operating income, which in turn allows to increase the value of the assets. So that's why you're buying, let's say you can buy relatively low, you're going to make a number of improvements, increase the income, decrease expenses, and then you'll be able to sell at a higher price. So I think that's all I have actually on, on the, this particular topic. I hope it, it made sense. You guys were very quiet or very patient. In any case, I hope it helped clarify how to unlock your wealth in 2024. And 
you know, we're able to shed some light on why investing in multifamily real estate is the, the way to go. All right. So if anybody has some questions, as always, feel free to reach out to us. There are, there's our email address. Chris um, is our newest member of the Boost Capital Group family. He's, he couldn't make it this evening, but he's a great addition and an awesome individual. But we're always available. Reach out to us. Shoot us a message. Let us know if there's something specific you want us to go over and we'll, we'll see what we can do. Besides that, thank you for joining us. And we look forward to having you on our next presentation of Real Estate Accredited. And right. have a wonderful weekend, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.